Well, uh, I'm going to use the podium so y'all all can be sure and see my seersucker, which I wore in honor of my uh, grandfather. Mike and I share a lot of things, and one of them is roots in the uh, sharecropper south. So we'll talk about that at the bar later. Um, you might have heard this rumor: the healthcare system's problems are large uh, and they're linked. Uh, so I'll be kind of brief because I know I look, as I look around this audience, I see uh, all of you know at least as much about this as I do. But I will just the, my formulation of the three problems is this. <coughs> Value for dollar, that is to say, we spend about twice as much as the OECD average countries. We spend far more than any other country per capita, and yet life expectancy is right around uh, 28. If you do life expectancy after 60, which some would say is more comparable because, after all, we have all this uninsurance problem and Europe does it, we're all the way up to 21st. So if you look at overall system performance, the World Health Organization ranks us 37th, right between Slovenia and Costa Rica. These are countries that should beat us at soccer, not compete with us at health care. So there's something really wrong with our value for dollar. Second, basically mediocre and highly uneven quality. It is true, if you're going to have a heart attack, this is the place to have it. We're very good at, at that. We're very good at neonatal intensive uh, interventions. But on average, Americans get what they should get from their doctor in, in the doctor's office, about 55% of what we know to be effective about 55% of the time they get what they should get. And it's also true, given all that low value for dollar, we're doing a heck of a lot of stuff that's not adding value, and we're not doing stuff that we know does add value. So mediocre quality and uneven quality is the second big problem. And the third big problem, of course, the one that is motivating, I would say, uh, crescendo in the presidential campaigns uh, upcoming, is inequitable access to care. And I, we'll talk about the uninsured. We could argue about how many there are. Roughly 45 million probably go without health insurance uh, for a full year. Roughly uh, 85 to 90 million will be uninsured over a couple year period, so it touches a lot of different people. But the shorthand way of understanding this is that essentially what we're doing at the moment is rationing access to care by income. And fundamentally, most of us think, and in fact, most Americans think, that's immoral and therefore it needs to be fixed. There are a couple ways to put a human face on that. I just came from Denver where I spent two days with the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission trying to, to redesign the, the Colorado health care system. And what happens when you go out and do these public meetings is you meet people from the public. I highly recommend it. It, it, should, <laughs> it should probably be done in small doses, but nevertheless it is useful. And I met a woman who just you know, came up to me and said, uh, I want to tell you my story, and told me about her brother, an adult, who basically died of appendicitis he went to the hospital uninsured. They gave him a little antibiotic and he went home and it ruptured. Now, I'm pretty sure the attending didn't think he was going to die in the next 24 hours, but the attending also knew he was uninsured and also knew that the budget was getting tight, and so he took a chance. And that's what happens. The Institute of Medicine, you may know, uh, a few years ago after a great study. Now, you all know about the Institute of Medicine. It's a wonderful institution. They typically assemble the learned sages of the healing arts and they meet for a couple of years and write really long papers with lots of footnotes and appendices and typically frankly conclude there's not enough evidence to reach a conclusion. <laughs> so when they reach a conclusion it makes news and this really did because they concluded like the story I just told you 18,000 Americans die every year for lack of access to health insurance and that lack of health insurance prevents them from getting access to care. Now out of 45 million uninsured, you could say that's not all that many, but I submit to you it's a far higher price than you want to pay. And what really motivates me personally, just as an aside, if you go back, if you believe the 18,000 number and you go back to the decline of the debate over the Clinton plan, and Reed's right, I do have lots of scar tissue over that, uh, but I would say if you do the math from 1994 until 2007, multiply by 18,000 per year, if we had told this nation a quarter of a million Americans were going to die because of lack of health insurance, maybe, just maybe, we'd have had a different outcome, but maybe not. I don't know. But I think we're going to talk about it in a serious way coming up in 08. So the problems are serious, they're large, and they're linked. You can't really solve one without the other. That's why you need comprehensive reform. But, you know, one of my favorite uh, philosophers is Winston Churchill, who famously said of Americans, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. I think it's unambiguously true that in healthcare, we've tried incremental reform now for oh, roughly 200 years, but really seriously, for the last 80. 
and we failed, and we failed miserably to improve our system. So we've got to have comprehensive reform. One of the things I drew from the Clinton experience is that comprehensive reform has to be bipartisan. That's why I came to New America two years ago. They're committed to that principle. It has to be bipartisan for a couple of reasons. You know, a lot of what I do, I would submit on a daily basis, is try to foment bipartisan conversation against my country's will. It's a hard thing, you know. But I will take a note here to notice yesterday's Senate finance vote on the SCHIP bill, after all the hoorah, 17 to 4. Sports fans, that's progress. We will take this as uh, evidence of growing support. So my problem in health care is that, of course, some Republicans feel compelled to pretend to believe things that are not true. And a fair number of Democrats clearly want things that cannot be. And my job in comprehensive health care reform is to piss them both off every day, but keep them talking to each other. And I think that is what New America is committed to. You might have heard we've got to have 60 votes. So whatever you may think about the philosophy of it, there's got to be bipartisan agreement or it ain't going to get out of the Senate. But more importantly by far, if only one party's representatives support a particular approach to reform, the American people are not going to trust them. So you've got to have genuine bipartisan buy-in to this thing. Okay, what does bipartisan health reform really mean? It means that both sides have to see core elements of their vision, of their narrative, about how to get at this system, and to how to get at reform, to how to see this system evolving over time. On the Republican side, it seems clear to me, that means individual responsibility, that means choice, that means markets, all those things have to be there. On the Democratic side, it means it's got to take care of everybody, and in particular, it's got to protect the low income and the high risk. And if it doesn't do all those things, you're not going to get bipartisan support. So that is precisely the sort of marching orders, if you will, into which we entered this, this process of constructing a health care plan that we think can appeal to the broad majority of Americans and, and actually advance the nation's uh, debate and, and arguably uh, the system. So it's built on two principles personal responsibility and shared responsibility. By personal responsibility, we mean, consistent with the citizen-based focus, we mean individuals are responsible for their own health. They have to take sit-ups and broccoli and all that stuff quite seriously. And they have to be responsible for seeking health care when appropriate so that they indeed uh, get professional advice when they need it. And finally, in order to do that in a real world, you're going to have to be responsible for acquiring insurance. You're going to have to have an individual mandate to require people to buy insurance or to acquire insurance in, in some way if they're eligible for, for subsidies of various uh, degrees. But you can't just put all the burden on individuals, and I think that's where a lot of the rhetoric around individual mandates discussion uh, has gotten distorted. We would never propose doing that without shared responsibility very cohesively built in. And by shared responsibility, basically I mean making personal responsibility possible. There are three big elements here. One, there must be a new market, and that market must work for all, not just for the sellers and not just for some of the buyers, but for all of the buyers. And that means there's got to be serious risk pooling. There's got to, the, the simplest way to convey a prototype of it would be the current Federal Employees Health Benefits Plan, FEHBP. We envision the markets being organized on a state basis, but if you think about a state like California, you might want three or four. That's okay. They're quite different. California is actually at least two nations, maybe three. Okay, and if you think about those little bitty states like the Dakotas, maybe they want a pool since there are only 27 of them anyway, and it won't really matter. But insurance companies will actually like it better if the pool is bigger. It's okay to allow states to, do, to uh, choose to do this. But the point is there's got to be a market open to all that works for all, which means serious insurance reforms. I already mentioned the individual mandate. You know, a mandate will make the insurance market work better. This is often a subtle point that is uh, somewhat controversial on some sides of the political spectrum. But increasingly, more and more people are coming around to see it because I think they read Thomas Jefferson as well, who said, you know, sometimes we must accept an evil in order to avoid a greater evil. And in fact, if you think about a mandate, it is hard to tell Americans they've got to do it. But if you don't, insurance markets don't work near as well because of adverse selection or the proclivity of those who need resources a lot to seek health insurance and those who, who are not uh, healthy to stay out. That, that problem, that adverse selection problem, will make your market very hard to, uh, to function. So the new market's got to be there. The second element of shared responsibility, there must be subsidies. Absolutely, no question about it. You would never impose a burden on a family that the society as a whole didn't think a family in their circumstance couldn't meet. So that means full subsidies for low-income populations, sliding scale subsidies 
uh, as we go up. We do taper, up, taper them off eventually. We use the tax system, the reform, that is to say we abolish the current uh, exclusion for employer contributions to premiums as a device to make that subsidy far more efficient, turn it into a credit. Today, basically, the tax system subsidizes a top two-thirds of our income distribution. And it, in, it subsidizes that at an increasing rate. We subsidize Bill Gates at a higher rate than we do the janitor who cleans up New America. In fact, the janitor who cleans up New America doesn't work for New America, works for a firm probably doesn't offer health insurance, which is uh, another little problem, which I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about. But the point is, we don't subsidize the low income. We subsidize the high income. What we would do is basically reverse that. We would fundamentally say there's no reason to subsidize Bill Gates to buy health insurance. Rumor has it. He's worried about his house, and so he'll buy health insurance to protect it. And there is a good reason to subsidize the low income, so we're going to take that money and do it that way. The third element of, personal respo of social responsibility or shared responsibility is stewardship. And I use that biblical word carefully and, and, and quite pointedly because I want to think about how do we use our collective ability to buy health, and health care far smarter. And I'll talk a little bit about um, some elements of that in, in a moment. But those are the three things of shared responsibility, new market, uh, subsidies, and stewardship. Perhaps, in fact, I'm just anticipating what the panel is going to say, um, the most controversial piece of what I'm proposing today and what I've uh, convinced my colleagues to sanction for at least another hour and a half until they hear the comments, um, is phasing out the employer role. That is to say, basically, we set up a system where you create the market first, into the market, everyone comes. In year one, the firm pays what they paid last year, yada, yada, go forward. Year two, the firms cash out what they paid last year and give the workers higher wages. And from that moment on, the amount the worker is responsible for paying for their health insurance, which remember they're required to buy, is a function of them, their income, and the subsidy schedule their fellow citizens have voted into being. So it really becomes, as Mike said, a contract between the citizen and the citizenry, or the citizen and other citizens. That's really the way we envision this. So why do we want to get the employer out of this? Well, you might have heard this rumor, health care costs are growing kind of fast. And in fact, if you look at the, as, as we look at the 21st century economy, we see the reality of international competition as a major, major constraint on reliance on the employer financing we've had in the past. Now, neoclassical economists will quickly jump to complain that how can this be, you know, we, what's your problem? Because after all, health insurance premium payments by firms come out of wages. So they're just, they're just, they don't understand, Lynn, what the real deal is. There's actually not an international competitiveness burden. To which I will begin to reply by saying, you know, the thing about economists, and as Reed said, I am one, in most days I'm proud of that, but in this particular issue, I'm not. The thing about economists is we're some, we're the kind of people who can look at something happening perfectly clearly in real life and then rush breathlessly back into our office to work out the math to see if it's possible. Now, the problem with the neoclassical vision of, of incidence of health insurance premiums is that it, it's a long-run model. It's a long-run concept. It's a long-run equilibrium idea. And over 30, 40 years, I think it's true. But here's the problem, as a famous economist named John Maynard Keynes pointed out one time. We all live in the short run. Here's the deal. If health care costs are growing faster than wages, and health care costs are growing faster than revenues, and health care costs are growing faster than everything else, okay, it's increasingly difficult to push all that health care cost growth into lower wages because workers resist that. You're going to hear something about that, I think, as we go forward. In the short run, it's very hard to push completely into wages. We've got to reduce wages a lot. Second, in a world of international competition, you can't push it forward into prices. And that's why I think you see so many CEO, so many corporations focused on trying to find ways to get out of this. If they were able to push it either into prices or into wages, why would they be cutting back on what they offer? Why would they be making the employee share go up? Why would some of them be dropping? Because what would be the problem? So fundamentally, I think the neoclassical economists are just, frankly, with all due respect, wrong about the short-run incidence of uh, premium payments. And uh, therefore, we feel like we've got to get them out of this in order to enable them to compete. On stewardship, let me just say the three pieces of that last element of shared responsibility are electronic health information system, not just records, but an information system, by which I mean enabling each clinician-patient encounter to access state-of-the-art best practice information so that we can bring what we do know now to bear 
on every decision. It's, it's not impossible. In fact, the RAND Institute has estimated it would save $100 billion a year if we did it right. Second, we've got to retool incentives. Both provide, right now we pay providers for doing stuff. We don't pay them for keeping you healthy. Similarly, we don't really have people make economical decisions about services that may or may not add value. We could do far better on that front. And finally, we need to invest in comparative effectiveness. We need to com uh, invest in comparative quality information so that we know which procedures work best for which subpopulations. It's possible. We can do this. It's not beyond the pale. In fact, a lot of people are working on how to do it as we speak. But let me close by reminding you why we're doing this. Let me close by reminding sort of what, what this is all about. I would submit to you, if we don't reorganize our health care system and make it far more efficient and make it work for everybody, then essentially um, we're not going to have it, be, it's not going to be possible for the middle class to continue to enjoy access to the health care as we know it. Health care costs are growing so fast. In 1987, a family policy cost about 7% of median family income. Today, that's 20 and that trajectory of health care costs growing so much faster than economy-wide productivity and wages means that an increasing fraction of our workforce cannot afford this. So either it's going to increasingly come out of workers on their own or firms, and to us that's an economic recipe for disaster. So to make it possible for all our citizens to sit at our health care table of plenty is why we're doing this, and to free employers to worry about what we need them to worry about, and that is to compete in a global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you.